Let us sing for joy, let us shout aloud to our King. Come, let us worship God, lifting holy hands, bless His name. Let's all stand. It is good to be home again. Wow, what a long, what a long journey. <laughs> Amazing uh, thing we. Uh, I got home last night and I took a picture of my tripometer and it was 4,509 miles from our door when we left to our door when we got home. So we the Lord is gracious <laughs> and He washed over us. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone on the web to this morning's service at Calvary Chapel McDonough. Let's begin praying this morning. Father, we thank you. God, we love you. We are so excited, Lord, to be in this building, Lord, to worship you. Father, you have told us that you will meet us when we draw together. And we know that you are here. 
And Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us, to fill us, Lord. We ask you to reveal the things within our hearts that you desire to be changed. And as we worship you and as we cry out to you and we give you these songs of praise, your Holy Spirit would be, begin to work in our lives. Lord, to tell us those things that you desire to take from us and allow us to let them go and have be filled with your Spirit. Have your way this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings the chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who slain. And worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Yes, all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Sing, this is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free.
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Like a fire shut up in my bones, I want the world to know you are God. With a passion coming deep within, I want the world to know that you live. Let your presence come and saturate every part of me, make me new. Let your spirit come and move within, fill me once again, cause I need more, Jesus I'm desperate for you, Jesus I'm hungry for you, Jesus I'm longing for you, cause Lord you are all I want Like a fire shut up in my bones I want the world to know You are God With a passion burning deep within I want the world to know That you live Jesus, I'm desperate for you. Jesus, I'm hungry for you. Jesus, I'm longing for you. Because, Lord, you are all I want. Jesus, I'm desperate for you. Jesus, I'm hungry. For you, Jesus, I'm longing for you, cause Lord, you are all I want. Come like a flood and saturate me now, you're all I want. Come like the wind and sweep throughout this place. You're all I want And come like the flood And saturate me now You're all I want and Come like the wind And sweep throughout this place You're all I want Jesus, I'm desperate for you, Jesus, I'm hungry for you, Jesus, I'm longing for you, Jesus, I'm desperate for you, Jesus, I'm hungry for you, Jesus, I'm longing. For you, cause all you are is all I want. And come like a flood, saturate me now, you're all I want. And come like the wind and sweep throughout this place, you're all I want. flood and saturate me now you're all I want and come like the wind and sweep throughout this place you're all I want cause Jesus I'm desperate for you Jesus I'm hungry 
for you, Jesus, I'm longing for you, because Lord, you are all I want, Jesus, I'm desperate, Jesus, I'm desperate for you. Jesus, I'm desperate. Jesus, I'm desperate for you. You stood before creation. Eternity with your hand. You spoke the earth into motion. My soul now understands. And you stood before my failure. You carry the cross for my shame. Sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So what could I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh God. Spirit alive with me, this life to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? What can I say? And what can I do? this heart, oh God, to breathe in you. So what can I say? What can I say? And what can I, what do? Can I do? But offer this heart.
Father, we thank you that we have this, this opportunity, Lord, to give to you a praise, Lord. Do that's worthy of your name. Thank you, Lord, for your dedication, Lord, to all the way to death on a cross for my sin. Holy Spirit, we ask you now to give us eyes to see and ears to hear and understanding in our heart of what your word is speaks and tells us of this love and of this forgiveness, Lord, and of this grace and this mercy. We pray in our Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all here. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. And uh, welcome to Calvary Chapel. Uh, hopefully you got a bulletin. If you didn't, they're out uh, front there on the table. And uh, just a few announcements before we get started. Um, there's a Seder meal on March 20th, and that's the Sunday before Easter. And we are going to be just setting up in the other room over here, our old room, and it's just going to be tables and chairs. We're having the full meal, and uh, Scott Dingfelder is going to come lead us just as you would a, a family. And so for all of us that serve, that we don't, we're not even going to bring the trailer, um, I don't believe. So it's just going to be a few of us coming in, setting up tables, and uh, it should be a nice day off. The children will be in with us and everything. So it'll be a really kind of neat family-type atmosphere. Um, also, uh, if you want to read uh, through the New Testament this year, you can join us. And we're in the book of Acts right now. And uh, on the bulletin, there's, there's this little box that says Project 345. You can go to our website, click on it, and it brings you right to the reading for that day. And uh, we also list it here, so you can just use your paper Bible if you want. And also, there's a prayer time, uh, 945, that we meet before the service and like to pray over the service. And anyone's welcome to join us for that. Also, hopefully you got one of these. If you did not, they're on the table out there, and this is a ministry opportunity for everybody. It doesn't matter how old you are or young you are. Uh, it doesn't matter if you work or whatever. It's a prayer opportunity, and um, uh, really good friends of Jill and, and uh, mine are uh, Ray and Be Rebecca Seaton, and uh, Rebecca uh, is going in with this team uh, to the women's prison. And uh, what they do is they ask for prayer. And I know there's a lot of writing on here, but I'm just going to give you the gist at the top here. Um, and she's asking us if we'd be interested in praying for their ministry team while they're there. They go in for a whole weekend. And uh, she says the team goes into the prison on Thursday, February 25th at 4 p.m. They finish up Sunday, February 28th at 4 p.m. Uh, the times that people can sign up to pray are 24 hours a day, and they're 30-minute slots. And each person that signs up, their name's put on a link uh, to a paper chain that is brought into the room on the second day. And it may not sound like a lot, like it would make a big impact, she says, but I assure you that it does. Sometimes it wraps around the room two, or two to three times. And so the women have a visual of the number of people sacrificing for them, and they can visually see love. And uh, she said this is uh, only one part of many that builds over the weekend to bring a compelling message of God's love for them. And uh, she says what is more important that we are covered in prayer. And there are uh, many things that you can pray for us about. And so uh, she's given us a list of things to pray about. Because so, you might be thinking, well, half an hour, what am I going to pray about? Well, there's a huge list. Just go through the list. And, and then if you still got time, go through it again and again, whatever. And it's all different times of the day. And so to sign up for it, on the back of this, you just go to this website. 
It's very easy, and, and there's steps here. You click on prayer vigil listings, and there's this, it's a big ministry. There's hundreds of listings. You scroll down to Pulaski State Prison, which is here in Georgia, and uh, there's just one for that date. You click on it, and it brings up a thing where you can just put in your name in any of the, bo- any of the time frames during that whole weekend. And, uh, and then down here it tells you a little bit more about uh, Keros, I think that's how you pronounce it, Prison Ministry International and, and what they're about. And, and uh, it says here at the bottom, each year over 25,000 inmates and their family members are introduced to God's love, grace, and forgiveness through uh, this ministry. So great opportunity. And let me just encourage you there. I went on there and there's a lot of open dates right now. And so they might have a pretty short chain. So uh, if you, if you can, it, it'd be a great opportunity. It's a great opportunity to pray. And uh, not only for them, it's a great opportunity for us uh, to sit down and, and spend 30 minutes in prayer is an awesome thing uh, for, for uh, each of us that do it as well. Not just the power of prayer, but just us kind of committing to, to that time with the Lord. Uh, the Lord will work in our lives too through that. So anyway, if you didn't get one of these, they're out on the table on there, and I encourage you to sign up uh, for a half-hour slot, whatever time's convenient for you. And I think that's it. Do we have any praise reports this morning? Uh, Nikolai, will you want to bring that to Lynn up there? I don't hear I think... Hello? There you go. That's better. You're well, up. I made it. I'm through surgery, completely pain-free. Praise God. Uh, All right. I'm just so grateful what God has done in his surgery. Um, the surgeon told me that after the surgery, I would have no pain. Well, he was right. I didn't even have pain in the surgery site, and they were surprised that I didn't need pain medication. Um, it just, it, it's so awesome to feel pain-free. It's been seven months. Yeah. Wow. And uh, so I want to thank everybody here that's prayed for me. Um, the power of prayer has certainly worked in my case. Sure. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Also, uh, my sister in law, uh, with her cancer situation, thank you, God. He has blessed her in such a way that the tube that was draining for the uh, yeah the blessings from God are that uh, the spots that was in her stomach have uh, disintegrated there's two spots in her in her um, in her stomach and then there's two spots on the liver they don't know about the liver yet but the spots in the stomach have disappeared Wow, so the power God. of prayer for her, we've been lifting her up for prayer yeah. for quite some time. Also, her husband, who's incarcerated, um, we're trying desperately to get him um, a commuted a sentence so that he can be home with her. And that's proceeding. We don't know yet what, what that is, but God is just working in our lives tremendously. Amen. Amen. Right. We got uh, any other uh, praise reports? I have one. This morning we had, uh, we got two flat tires on the trailer, and uh, not even at the same time. We got one, and then uh, I had to run back to the house and get the jack, and we, we uh, got it fixed, and then got it right in, pulled in here with another one. And, uh, and I know it sounds funny as a praise, but uh, it's just amazing. Things happen. That's probably been the most severe thing, but uh, we've had a lot of different things happen um, before our setup. And every single time the Lord uh, comes through, I mean, we were a half an hour late probably, and we were still set up and still had our huddle at the same time, 9.30 or right there. And it's just amazing how uh, everything else, when things, something like that happens, the Lord just puts everything together, uh, and it always comes, he always comes through. And it's just, uh, uh, just an example of God working in our lives as individuals like that. When difficult times come, he'll get us through. And so, do we have any, uh, any needs for prayer this morning? If you'd raise your hand, we're going to gather around you and pray for you. Now then, all right, well, I'm just going to uh, pray for us, and Bob's going to come up and uh, uh, bring, us through the, bring us the word this morning. 
So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for these praise reports. Lord, we thank you for uh, Lynn and uh, uh, just working in his life. And we ask that you continue to heal his uh, incision and, the, and his throat, or the stuff that was just the surgeon, you know, pushed out of the way to, uh, to do the work, Lord. And we just thank you that it was successful and that he's healing up so well, Lord. And we just give the praise and, all, and glory to you. And Lord, also for uh, the sister-in-law with the the cancer, we ask that you continue, uh, Lord, that you would heal her liver as well, uh, Lord, and also that you would arrange that her husband could could spend some time with her. And Lord, we just uh, lift up this time to you. We thank you for for always coming through for us. And so, Lord, we just ask that you you would uh, come through this morning with your word, Lord, that you would uh, bless our hearts, that we would uh, hear your word, Lord, and it would. Uh, change our lives this morning, that we would go out of here uh, knowing you a little better, Lord. And so uh, be with Bob now as he uh, presents your word to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I know Peter had already greeted you and made you feel welcome through our praise and worship this morning, uh, but I also wanted to, uh, to greet some friends of mine from Alabama who are listening in via the web, so welcome Alabama. It's not very often that you are feel, you're felt welcome in the state of Georgia. Um, several weeks ago, uh, Rob and I talked about uh, me speaking this morning and and teaching the word, and and uh, here lately, I've really tried to instead of doing topical sermons, really tried to follow uh, where Rob left off. And and uh, when he left off in Romans chapter 15 a couple of weeks back, I started reading through the verses after he left off. I thought, man, yeah, this isn't very, this is kind of Leviticus type stuff. And and uh, so I, I was really, in my mind, I was really struggling, um, and how, you know, how this was all going to come together. And believe it or not, this is the quickest a sermon has ever came together for me as I, as I began to put it down on paper. The way the Lord worked through me, it was almost like him saying, none of my stuff is boring. What were you thinking? And, and so it just, the, the words just came alive to me. So this morning as we go through uh, this passage in Romans chapter 15, I, I, I just I pray that I am a faithful messenger to God's word because it's God that we bring glory to. It's not any of us, but it's God. So if you would, uh, please stand for the reading of God's word. We're in Romans chapter 15, verses 14 through 21. Romans 15, verse 14 through 21 says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you, because of the grace given to me by God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus and the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and around about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, and so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, but as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. Heavenly Father, as we dig into your word this morning, I pray that it will be fully understandable to us, that there will not be any question, no mystery. Father, that we can take these verses and apply them to our lives right now and for the rest of our lives. It's not something that we hear and we soon forget, but Father, that it changes the way we look at you. It changes the way that we look at our communities. It changes the way we interact with our families, Father. 
That's my prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So beginning in chapter 12 of Romans, Paul writes about several topics to those in Rome that could be construed as criticism. He talks about things like being living sacrifices to God, serving God with spiritual gifts, behave like a Christian, submit to the government, love your neighbor, put on Christ, the law of liberty, the law of love, bearing others' burdens, glorify God together. Now, people can take those as good things, but they can also take them as, what, I'm not doing that already type of attitude, but that's not what Paul was really trying to do. So when he gets to verse 14 of chapter 15, he says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Paul is letting them know, even with his previous admonishments, they are full of goodness, that they have been filled with all knowledge of the gospel message and are able to build one another up in Christ. Matter of fact, some of the early manuscripts have others instead of one another, meaning that they are able to also admonish the Jewish converts as well. It's not just the Gentiles. In verses 15 and 16, he goes on and says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you, because of the, gospel, or because of the grace given to me by God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that he or that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable sanctified by the Holy Spirit Paul is reminding them of God calling him out on the road to Damascus as a minister to the Gentiles this word ministering is similar to the Jewish custom prior to Christ where you had the priests uh, ministering to the people to the Jewish nation um, it was the actual act of the priest. So Paul is saying that he is presenting them to God as an acceptable offering. He makes it very clear, though, that he is only presenting the gospel. God is providing the Holy Spirit upon their acceptance of Christ. It's not him. It's not about us. It's all about God. As we move through this world... There are many things in lives that we touch. We must always be careful to attribute those things of God to him, not ourselves. It can be easy to take the credit for certain things. When we stay in constant contact with God and stay close to him through his word, it makes it easy. When everything we say, listen to this, when everything we say is to build up and edify the church, fellow believers, and Christ himself, it makes it easy. We as Gentiles, accepting Christ as our Savior, have been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Sanctified, set apart. We've been set apart for Christ. The Bible says in John 17, 17, John chapter 17, verse 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This is Jesus praying for his disciples. God's word is truth. His word, the Bible, tells us that if we believe that Jesus Christ died for all our sins and we accept him as our Savior, that we will have eternal life with him in heaven. As believers, we have been set apart first by the truth of God's word, and doubly by the Holy Spirit, we receive the Holy Spirit as that seal of redemption within us. The Bible tells us that. And this is the picture that I get in my mind when I think of this seal. It's like those little flashy shoes that little kids have. Every time you take a step, it lights up. And when I think of this as being the, the, the seal of the Holy Spirit within us, and it's like every time we take a step, God says, there you are, there you are. There you are. That's what I think of in my mind. Now, this is not Paul's rendition. This did not come from the book of Romans. This is my own word picture, okay? I want to make sure you don't get that confused there. That's all mine. So in verse 17, it talks about, uh, or it says, therefore, 
I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. Now, the way I was taught, as you read through the Bible and you see the word therefore, you have to ask what it's there for. Does that make sense? So you've got to go back up and look at what came before it. So when we look back at 15 and 16, Paul reminds the Romans that he is the minister appointed by God for the Gentiles. He is able to offer them up as a sacrifice. But he is saying in verse 17 that he is not reveling in his own works nor wants glory for his actions. He only wants to glory or boast, as some translations say, in Christ Jesus, in what Christ was to him. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That's what Christ was to Paul. Paul could boast of what he had from him and through him, spiritual blessings in him, a large measure of grace he had received from him, and of great gifts and talents Christ had bestowed on him. He gloried in his cross and boasted of a crucified Jesus whom others despised. He made Christ the subject of his ministry and took delight in preaching the gospel. He freely owned that all he did was through Christ strengthening him and that all of his success in his work was owed to him being Jesus. And of this, he had to glory. And that's some good preaching. That's some good preaching right there. Let's pause here for a moment. How often do we glory in the Lord or boast about Jesus Christ who saved us? How can we ascribe our life and everything in it to the Holy One? Our family, our jobs, our communities, our friendships all come from God. We can do nothing on our own. John chapter 15, verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. As a challenge to all of us, let's practice this week boasting about Christ. He's done everything. His words while hanging on the cross were, it is finished no matter how many people with whom we share the gospel or how, how many people uh, we feed when hungry no matter how many people we visit in prison or how many folks we close it will never equal what christ did on the cross for all humanity i'm not saying don't take the gospel to others i'm not saying don't feed visit or clothe i am saying that when we do it is not for our glory that we do these things, but for Christ alone. The only reason we would ever do these things in the beginning is because of what he has already done. Verse 18 and 19, back in Romans chapter 15. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and around about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Paul is saying in verse 18 that he will not take credit for work others have done through Christ. He will also have nothing to do with false doctrines which may have been taught. He only wants to focus on those things that Christ has done through him. In verse 19, he confirms that he comes with the power of the Holy Spirit as seen through mighty signs and wonders. These were the marks of the apostles and the early church leaders as there were no other marks to show they, they were foundation layers, Christ being the only foundation. There was no written New Testament yet. It was just the apostles preaching the gospel and the message being carried by those that received it. Paul was called by Christ himself to fulfill this role. In Ephesians 2, verses 19 and 22, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19, it says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, 
having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Jesus Christ is the foundation for all mankind, whether we accept him or not. It does not matter if we accept Christ as our Savior or not. He is still the chief cornerstone. Just because some don't believe it to be doesn't make it so. The apostles and prophets are not the foundation, simply the foundation layers. In Acts chapter 14, verse 3, Acts 14, verse 3, it says, Therefore they being the disciples, stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Again, these were the mark, marks of the apostles. These were not new signs. These mighty works were a continuation of the work of Christ from the time he turned the water into wine, mentioned in the, first, uh, in the second chapter of John, to the catching of 153 fish in a net that did not break, written about in John chapter 21. These miracles were established by Christ, and after his ascension, his apostles could be known by them. At some point later, after the gospel message had spread through the land, it was not just dependent on the signs and wonders brought by the messengers of the word. The word also had to be preached. Matter of fact, in 2 John verse 10 and 11, 2 John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, 2nd John, verse 10, it says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. This is not to say signs and wonders don't exist or that miracles no longer happen. It does not mean the spiritual gifts cease. On the contrary, these signs and wonders and spiritual gifts can happen when Jesus' doctrine is brought to non-believers and they accept him as their savior. It happens when believers assemble according to his doctrine to pray and lift up holy hands. It happens when one of our brethren is restored to righteousness according to the doctrine after falling away or being encumbered with sin. All of these are examples of miracles we see each and every day. Without the doctrine, the holy word of God, how would we even know that these are even miracles? There are some that practice some of these miracles, wonders, and signs and don't have the doctrine. We must be careful, friends, to steer clear of those folks. Else, as the Bible says in 2 John, we share in their evil deeds. Our job in life as Christians is not to figure out what all of these other religions are. It's not to figure out what Allah means. It's not to figure out what this means or what that means or why they do this instead. No, our job as Christians is to take the gospel message to others. Period. The only way we can know what to avoid is to thoroughly know God's word. We don't know God's word. How can we walk away from what's being taught that's evil? There are hundreds of reading plans to help us read the Bible. There are 90-day plans. There are weekday plans. There are one-year plans. Plans that remind us that it doesn't take long to read a chapter, 345. But it's not about how long it takes us to read a chapter or even the entire Bible. The task is not to simply read, but to understand, to apply, and to share. That's our role. It's not, yep, I, I read today, I read today, I read today, I'm, I'm in good shape. No, that's not, it's not a checklist. The Bible isn't something that we can just right off as we get things read in it. You can't just read it once. I got to read it over and over and over again so that I fully understand what is God saying that I need to change in my life? 
What is he saying that I need to take out and present as a gospel message? That's why I read the Word. The Bible contains over 600 characteristics or names of God. The other day, and I've got this, this guy that I work with, his name's David. We have a cup of, a cup of coffee every morning about 5.30. Uh, and it's just, it's a great time. And uh, he and I started just on accident almost meeting together. And, and it quickly rolled into a spiritual meeting. And it's just, it's really been a blessing to me. But I, as we were sitting there talking over coffee one morning, I said to him, I said, you know, if I were to go up on the top of our building that we work at right now, and I was going to shout praises to the Lord, going back to these 600 names of God that you see up on the screen, if I were trying to recall all of these different names, how long would I be able to shout praises? Would I be able to do it for 15 minutes? The song that you guys ended with, oh my goodness, that was beautiful. Shout it from the mountains. Wow. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of when, when, when I'm thinking about the praise to God. How long could I, how well do I know the Bible to be able to shout for a long period of time? Because I want to. I really do. But after a period of time, it's like I run out of, uh, what do I need to say now? I, I can't remember anything else to add to it. But would it be for 15 minutes? Five minutes? Two minutes? Rob was talking earlier about uh, spending some time in prayer for this, for this prison ministry. A half an hour is a long time to pray. A long time to pray. And it's, it's okay if you're in it and, and three or four of you are gathered together. It makes it a little bit easier to make it through that. Not that we have to time prayer or anything, but to sit down and continuous focus on that prayer time without my mind wandering, it's very, very difficult for me to do. I'll get a hunger pain, and I'm, now I'm thinking about what's for lunch, and I, I just get, I'm all over the place. It's a gift to be able to spend that much time in prayer before the Lord. But how well, how well do we know the Bible? How well... Have we uh, studied those characteristics of Christ, those characteristics of God, so that when it is our opportunity to praise him in front of others, that we can do it? I constantly think of that video title, That's My King. And I mentioned it, and Dana said, you're not going to show that again, are you? I love that thing. Every time I watch it, it, man, it brings tears to my eyes thinking about it. But as this guy, Pastor S.M. Lockridge, he is for two or three minutes straight, not even taking a breath hardly, he is just rambling about Christ and about God. And after he does this for two or three minutes portraying God, he says, I wish I could describe him to you. It just gives me goosebumps thinking about that. And he's not reading from any notes, he's just standing up here like I am right now and he is just, this is who God is to me. He is my redeemer. He died for me on the cross. The Pharisees couldn't stop him. And he just, he's just going on. And Wow, that's my God. That is my God. How well do we know our king and master? Can we recount the numerous miracles we have witnessed both through his word and in our lives? If we can't, Describe him to someone in a way that causes them to be obedient to the calling through the Holy Spirit. Shame on us. If we don't have that intimate knowledge of our Savior, the Alpha and Omega, the bright and morning star. I'm going to get choked up here in a minute just thinking about what great God we serve. How can we possibly know what is false and not of the true doctrine contained in the Bible. As believers, it is imperative that we see the world through Christ's eyes. And when we are presented with something that is not of God, we resist. The Bible tells us in James 4, 7, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 
We cannot resist if we don't know the absolute goodness and truth of the living Word of God. Verse 20 and 21, Romans 15. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, but as it is written, to him he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. Here Paul is describing his true calling, being a missionary. Paul was not saying he was too, br- too proud to build on another man's foundation. He was simply saying it was his honor and calling to go where no man had gone before, be- to present the gospel message of Jesus Christ. There were no church leaders to meet him. There were no committees preceding him, preparing the place where he would speak. There was no ribbon cutting or being greeted by the mayor. Matter of fact, the only public figure who may have greeted him was the chief of police, and that was only to arrest him. It is one thing to go from one church to another or one community to another and talk to other believers. It is quite different to go somewhere to talk about Jesus with someone who has never heard the name. I do not want to take away from the power of local ministries. That is not what I am trying to do. I am simply saying that there are some folks, like Paul, that are called into the ministry in order to take the message to those that have never heard it. There are others that are equipped to deal with the de-churched, folks that have been disenchanted, for instance, with a particular church and turned away from organized religion. There are those, too, who are equipped to lovingly bring back those that have fallen away due to the struggles of life. God has equipped each of us with an ability to draw people to him. Think about it. As believers, with our light-up shoes, being the Holy Spirit, How can we not have a desire to bring others to the feet of Jesus? What anointing have you received, enabling you to lock arms with someone and accompany them to the King of glory? Are you using it? If so, how are you encouraging others to do the same? If not, why not? What other encouragement besides having this joyous life in Christ could you possibly need? Really. If we love the Lord Jesus Christ and want to serve him with all of our heart, mind, and strength, why would we not want to bring other people to him? As Christians, we should not view sharing the gospel like some folks view an exercise program when they realize they need to get healthy. (laughs) This should not be viewed as a program, but a way of life. Each and every one of our breaths should be praising the Almighty Son of God. Every action, every facial expression, every eye movement we have should be intentional and bring praise to our Father in heaven. Have you ever brought someone to the throne of Christ where they accepted him as their Savior? Wow, that is an awesome experience. I'm telling you, if you've never done it, man, it just, it just brings chill bumps to you because you realize that they have seen the face of Jesus. There is no greater feeling or thrill And when you present the gospel message to someone and when you look, when you see the look of shame and guilt in their eyes and then you see it quickly flash to relief and joy. Even the angels in heaven want to study this event. Matter of fact, in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 12, it says, to them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you that through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. The angels in heaven, they'll never experience that. They will never be able to experience the feeling of accepting Christ. They've always been with him since their creation. We, on the other hand, get to experience the redemptive power of the Savior We get to finally accept this free gift and our spiritual burdens begin to melt away 
as we repent of those sins that we have in our life and continue to repent through the remainder of our life as we obey that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. Paul finishes up the last verse, 21, with, it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. This could probably be considered Paul's life verse. Paul was set on delivering the message to those who had never heard nor seen. Through this, Christ was made alive to those that heard and accepted their new Savior. I've heard many folks say they have a life verse. This may be a verse you feel that describes you. It may be one that describes what you feel Christ has called you to do. It may be one that helped you during a crisis in your life. Whatever the reason, it's a verse that you can go back to periodically to refresh refresh yourself as needed. I'm not suggesting that you have one. I'm not suggesting that you don't. What I want to point out is that Paul is quoting the scriptures. He probably had it memorized rather than thumbing through the rolls of parchment. I think that memorization of scripture is a dying art. With the advent of e-Bibles and the internet, it's so easy to look something up. Again, I'm not saying using these tools that are available to us are a bad thing. Some have value, but I think that there is value in memorizing Scripture. Imagine, all right, I'm going to draw a little picture here for you. Imagine if every time that you were asked about your family, you had to pull out your phone and say, hang on just a minute, let me, uh, let me look that up. That's why it's important to memorize Scripture. I'm not talking about Facebook when you're trying to get a hold of people. I'm talking about what color hair do they have? Let me see. We have to know the Word. We have to know the Word of God. I want to uh, read several verses, and I want to see if you can tell me what they have in common. The first verse is, All have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Acts 16.31. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is great. Ephesians 6.1. Depart from evil and do good. Psalm 34.14. Even a child is known by his doings. Proverbs 20.11. Fear not, for I am with thee. Isaiah 43, 5. God is love. 1 John 4, 8. Honor thy father and thy mother. Exodus 20, verse 12. I am the vine, you are the branches. John 15, 5. Jesus wept. John 11, 35. Keep thy tongue from evil. Psalm 34, 13. Look unto me and be ye saved, Isaiah 45, 22. Marvel not, you must be born again, John 3, 7. No man can serve two masters, Matthew 6, 24. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, Psalm 118, 1. Praise ye the Lord, Psalm 127, 1. Quench not the spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Exodus 20, verse 8. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, 33. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Proverbs 3, 5. Unto us a child is born. Isaiah 9, 6. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Romans 12, 19. Wait on the Lord. Psalm 27, 14. Exceeding great and precious promises are given unto us. 2 Peter 1, 4. You are the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14. Zion heard and was glad. Psalm 97, 8. 
Did you figure out what ties these verses together? The alphabet. Several years ago, my pastor in Ohio, uh, Pastor Dale Geyser, was preaching. And his mom and dad, both in their 80s, were in the service. And out of nowhere, he said, hey, mom, do you remember your alphabet? And she said, I sure do. And Goldie proceeded to say, A, and read that verse. B, read the verse. She went all the way through the entire alphabet. And only twice during that time, her husband, Elmer, who was in his 80s as well, had to remind her and help her only twice. That's how she was taught her alphabet in school. Memorizing the scriptures. When was the last time we memorized the scripture and more importantly, and then was able later to share it with someone. We have to bury his word in our hearts and our minds. As Christians, we have a responsibility to honor the word of God in our lives. If we only kind of know it, we will only kind of honor him. Imagine if you were on a Major League Baseball team You would not show up to the game without your hat or cleats. When we show up for life, we need to be fully clothed in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. How brightly are your shoes lighting up? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing this Word alive, if nothing else for me this morning, Father. What a blessing it is to dig into your word, to study it, Lord, and more importantly, to apply it. Lord, I am so thankful for this body of believers here, Lord. The number of volunteers we have that make everything happen, make everything fall into place. And it's all to bring glory to you, Father. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. As the praise and worship team leads us in a song this morning, if you have a need for prayer, If you've got something going on in your life, you need some encouragement, or if you want to accept Christ for the very first time in your life, come down and meet Rob and I down here in this front row, and we will be more than happy to pray with you. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect. In
in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. And oh, a love so undeniable, I, I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think that you call us deeper still and you call us deeper still and you call us deeper still into love love, love you're a good, good father it's who you are it's who you are who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am you're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Jesus, you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. Father, because you are good, you desire to bestow good gifts to your children. Father, in your word, you tell us that you would not ever give us a stone when we ask for bread. Father, you are willing and ready to give to us, Lord, your very best. And all you ask is that we give our very best. So, Father, as we leave from here, as we go from here, as we understand your word, may it be in our hearts. When the world asks us about our lives, may you come out of our mouths, Father. May they, when they ask us about what goes on with our families, Father, would you come out? Would your word, Lord, be ready? Lord, help us to memorize your word. Help us to burn it into our hearts, God, to know it, that we can give that hope of our life, Lord, which is you. We praise you and we give you all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. But before you leave, we have one message that Bob would like to speak.
anyway, um, Jill's mom asked that uh, we mention <laughs> and bring that up. Well, I'm not supposed to, I'm not going to use this. All right, I'll use it. Anyway, um, we just want to recognize Jill and Rob. Um, I was thinking before I brought them up here, as we look around at the, the different members of the congregation, we probably have two or 250 years of marriage represented in this place. And um, that's pretty unusual. Um, the averages say that 50% of all people, whether in a church or out of a church, have been divorced. So I think our numbers are a little higher than most, which is kind of cool. But um, I just wanted to say thank you to the both of you for being examples um, in everything that you do, including your marriage. Thank you guys so much. I just want to say a real quick prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, uh, what a blessing uh, Rob and Jill are to us, Lord. Uh, through examples in every aspect of their lives, um, we just thank you for that. And Lord, we just pray that their marriage will just continue to be rock solid on your foundation, Lord. That you are the center and that they just continue to love one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we've got uh, snacks and refreshments out here set up on a table, so please hang around after the service and enjoy. Thank you.